Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, How Business Value Engineering Unlocks the Potential of Digital Transformation. I'm your host, Mariah Weiss, and on behalf of IIBA, thanks for joining us today. Today's webinar is a public event. It's designed to deliver practical resources for you as you continue to grow your skill set and deliver value within your organization. When you join IIBA, you become a member of an international association dedicated to developing and promoting the business analysis profession. Your IIBA membership gives you access to a vibrant BA community and resources to support your development and career growth. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A section in your webinar controls at the bottom of your Zoom window. IIBA is a not-for-profit professional association serving the growing field of business analysis, and our goal is to unite a community of professionals to create better business outcomes. As the global thought leader and voice of the business analysis community, IIBA works to maintain global standards for the ongoing development of the practice and certifications. This webinar is brought to you our IIBA sponsor, Capsify. Capsify is a leading provider of software for business architecture and business model innovation. Their digital operating model platform, Jalapeno, supports architects in planning and managing business model innovation and transformation from conception through to execution. They help customers organize their agility and their business performance, establishing the operating model as a dynamic, interactive, and enduring business asset. We would like to thank Capsify for supporting IIBA and the business analysis community. I would also like to introduce our presenter from Capsify, founder Terry Roach. Terry is the lead architect of the Jalapeno business modeling platform. He leads a PhD from the, or he holds a PhD from the University of the New South Wales, and his 2011 thesis developed the Capsicum framework, a semantic meta model for the design of strategic business architecture. Without further ado, I'll hand this presentation over to Terry. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mariah. Appreciate that kind intro. And um, good day, everybody from Sydney, Australia. Um, amazing to see such a, a diverse audience. I'm just going to get my screen set up and get ready to go. Um, I love these sessions with the IIBA. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I'm actually on the global board of directors of the IIBA and uh, a big supporter. We, we at Capsify are a sponsor and um, very much uh, behind what, we, what you do. And uh, the audience is always the most engaging one that I ever get a chance to speak to. So looking forward to it. And feel free to, I'll definitely try and leave enough time for us to have a good conversation at the end. So business value engineering, what a, what a topic, what a mouthful. Um, really, what we're really going to be talking about today is how we can help design your future. Um, I'm going to introduce my topic with the obligatory digital transformation slide. Uh, what, would a, what would a presentation in, the, in this era be without somebody mentioning digital transformation? the past decade, this has pretty much been the topic um, to the point that we are already probably sick of it. Um, but there's no denying that digital transformation has been what's been fueling this huge wave of technology investment for the past 10 or more years. Um, in fact, there's no slowing down. If you look at the projections, they, it, the numbers only get bigger, $2.3 trillion expected to be spent on it um, in the, uh, in, in the, in, by next year. Um, and unfortunately, we're still very bad at it. That's the real unfortunate situation. Nearly 84% of, of initiatives are not really delivering on their results or the objectives that they set for themselves. I'm sure most of you are in organizations that in some form or another are doing some sort of transformation. And the, and the challenges that we see that are causing some of these, this pain is firstly, that it's really difficult to understand what to change. Decision makers don't have access to the sorts of insights that they need at hand. And part of the reason for that is all the knowledge about their business is so static, fragmented and disconnected. And that means that it's really difficult to decide what to do and how to prioritize your investments. 
In fact, what we're trying to really do is change the whole um, engine on, a, on our uh, airplane while we're in mid-flight. And of course, that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. A lot of organizations take the digital side of the phrase quite literally and think that it, the, the project is really all about technology adoption. In fact, that's probably where we think a lot of things go wrong. When you um, consider the fact that, according to Gartner, uh, only about 3.7% uh, of annual revenue is spent on the IT operational budget. In other words, this tiny little sliver over here. If what you're trying to do is optimize for IT, you really are optimizing for a very small part. The rest of that budget is largely spent on the transformation program itself and the business as usual. And this great big elephant over here, this is the thing that is so hard to actually transform. Deloitte have another aspect, uh, perspective on it where they, yeah, it's showing similar numbers uh, and they recognize that, that uh, uh, the, the amount of money being spent or the percentage of money being spent on innovation and incremental business change. <clears throat> so if what we're trying to do then is then if the real focus should be on, on innovating the business model, what do, where does innovation start and how do you do innovation? Well, Jeannie Ross, a uh, well-known author from MIT, she's, she's written several books on enterprise architecture and her most recent book is called um, Designing for Digital. She has a really great perspective that I like. She says, there are two things you can do if you're trying to innovate. On the one hand, you can innovate your value proposition, which is actually really a very product-centric uh, view of things and, in, and probably is, this, is where the product-centric, the Spotify sort of approach to transformation and, and the safe um, uh, agile methodologies very much focus on a product-centric, product-owner type view. Um, where we provide for our products features of enhancements and user stories. And that probably, for most of you who are involved in, tra in any kind of transformation problem, program that uses Agile, you're probably familiar with this concept that you have your product owners and they come up with their features and you develop user stories. <clears throat> the challenge is that that's a very A, product-centric and B, delivery-focused approach. When we think of the value proposition, there's actually quite a lot more to it than just the product. There's, you could be, you could, the product itself may not be the issue. It might be the place. Maybe you're going digital with the same product. Maybe it's to do with the promotion and maybe it's to do with the price. So there's a whole much more complex perspective on what it is that you're offering. The other aspect of what you could deliver, if it's not, it may not be the product or the offering at all. It may actually be the way in which you deliver those products and those offerings. In other words, the value stream. So these are the two very different perspectives of where you can apply innovation. And if you're, doing, if you're innovating the value stream, the corresponding components of the, that your user stories map to are no longer product features, but actually business outcomes. Business outcomes that are going to uplift one or other aspect of the operating model that underpins the value stream. In other words, the skills, the processes, the information or the technology right, that underpin the business operating model. Now, this can be neatly packaged into a view that shows us how um, capability-based planning and product-oriented uh, transformation both can follow exactly the same path. They're very, very similar. It's just looking at things from a slightly different perspective. At the same, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is feed the delivery backlog with epics and user stories. But the biggest challenge, and this is what we're going to focus on today, the biggest challenge in, in transformation is this column here. What is it that we're actually going to change? How do we define what business outcomes are, are, are needed uh, to achieve our goals? What are the right ones? How do we prioritize them? Well, how do we identify what are the features and enhancements that we want to, to apply to our offerings? This is where innovation happens, is, is in this column. And it starts with the concept of an idea. You can have ideas for products, and you can have ideas for your business operating model. And all of these ideas feed into the same common backlog 
where you can take them through a life cycle of stages, prioritization, design, building the business case, scheduling it, and then putting it into the agile backlog. So that is really, I think, the part that's missing from most agile delivery programs. We all start with in, in an agile project with the backlog, the mythical backlog, and we're all presuming that there's the right stuff put into it. How that gets there, this is the challenge. And that's what we're going to focus on today. In fact, um, uh, the other last point to make here is that it's not necessarily that you're doing one or the other. They, they are not mutually exclusive, uh, complementary, and in fact, a transformation may in fact cover both or, or, or either. And in fact, our other point to make on transformation is that it's really not about transforming this great big one-off thing. It's about building the capacity to continuously transform. Transformation happens in small iterative phases and stages and, and initiatives, and it's a constant mechanism. So by ad adopting a framework like this and understanding how to go about innovating across these diverse dimensions, you can put in place a, a mechanism for continuous change. If you don't have this, you're like Alice asking the Cheshire cat. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And in our view, this is exactly where digital transformation initiatives have struggled. They, the, they just haven't really got the, the correct methodology and plan for understanding where they want to get. So if you're trying to figure out where you want to get, the best way that we've identified to do that is through the lens of value. What is the value in doing this exercise and what value are we actually trying to bring to our ecosystem? And the concept of business value engineering is both a method and approach and, and in fact an architecture and we're going to take you through some of that today. Now I would say um, the objective in this half hour, 45 minute session is to just give you a flavor of how we see this happening. A uh, little promotion at the end, we'll give you a, a, a link. We have a gift for you, which is a detailed document that explains this methodology in more detail. And you can go ahead and pick that up. So don't worry too much about snapping screens and so on. You'll get all of this at the end. So what we're going to discuss is how we, how we go through this process of, of determining, first of all, what is value and who, what does it represent to the diverse stakeholders to whom we, we, we are um, um, targeting this transformation. How do we align that, our objectives and our strategic plan into that value map? What are the value propositions for the offerings? What are the uh, planning out our, the delivery uh, mechanisms for delivering value through our customer journeys? And finally, tracking the value realization as the transformation unfolds. So taking those five stages of define, align, design, plan, and track, and looking at it from the underlying concepts that we work through, we call this the architecture of business value. So in the first stage, what we're trying to do is determine the dimensions of value. Who are we driving to with the, with the value co contribution? And there could be various, of course, there's and the, the perspective of the company shareholders, your internal stakeholders, customers, ecosystem partners, and in fact, things that are more global in nature and social in nature, such as environmental and stability, sustainability, which is of course such a topical moment right now. When you think of that, value is a completely different thing to each one of these. What we need to understand is who, what, what does, value represent in the eyes of each of these stakeholders and who exactly is the stakeholder that we're actually targeting more could be more than one with that in mind then we can start defining what we call a value map and we'll talk to show you what that looks like value maps are a hierarchical decomposition of value targeted at one or other of these stakeholders where we break that down the value dials and uh, what the, the, the decomposition uh, components of, the, of value. And then we align business drivers to those dials, business drivers being the things that we can do to achieve that value. With that value mapping in, 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 in place, we can then take our strategic plan and our, and our proposed uh, initiative and align our objectives to the value dials to, to identify exactly where our 
uh, firstly at a, at a company level, what sort of our, our perspective on co value contribution is. And in fact, probably identify things where you've got value that you'd like to achieve. You may not even have any objectives aligned to those. And similarly at the more operational level of the change of the business outcomes of the initiative, aligning them to the business drivers that are underpinning those value drivers. And we'll go into that in a sec. Right, then moving on to once we once we have that in place, we can start these, these business outcomes actually are the ideas that we're going to flow into either the value proposition or the value stream, the value delivery. We'll talk about value propositions, what they are, how they're constructed. In fact, it's all focused on individual personas that you're targeting and the offerings. And, and by examining from a persona perspective, what jobs are to be done, what they're trying to achieve, the pains and gains that they face with that, we can gradually decide that by design our own offerings and, and come up with new, new ways of delivering value, but deeper understanding of who we're trying to deliver that value to. That's the, the perspective of the offering. The perspective of the value stream is how do we actually deliver that offering to the customer? The customer experiences that delivery through something called a customer journey, and uh, which is broken down into the stages they go through in receiving that uh, in, in, that, in those interactions with us. And the customer journey is underpinned by our internal upgrading model driven by the value stream. So each of these stages have a corresponding stage into the value stream. Value streams assemble and coordinate and orchestrate business capabilities in each of the, as they move their way through. And business capabilities are the aggregation of these four dimensions of the operating model, the people, the process, the information and technology that you need to support each of these capabilities. So this little map that gives you this amazing, we call this a service blueprint, outside in, the inside out, the on stage, the backstage, whatever you like to call it. But it gives you this holistic perspective of each of your customer interaction journeys um, that you can then overlay pain points, priorities, uh, needs, change, maturity, risk, whatever it might be across these beautiful little canvases, which is um, what we're trying to get to by the end. And finally, how do we track all of this? Quantitatively through value trees, objectively and, and, and measuring um, our, our OKRs, these objectives over here, what are the key results that we're trying to achieve those that are, that are measurable, identifying the benefits and, uh, and, uh, get, um, and defining them up front and then tracking that they're actually being, being achieved and then overlaying risk and governance across the whole thing. So to us, that's the architecture of what we need to be doing. And with that in mind, let's try, take a quick look at some of the artifacts that we could be producing along the way. As I said, from here on, it's gonna be a whistle stop tour, running through things quite quickly, um, and then um, giving us time to, to, to um, um, have questions at the end. And what we'll do is you, you'll be able to get the detail from the um, download. So, as we talked about, the, the definition of value, the dimensions from the various perspectives, as you can see, shareholders would have a very different view. Their view is all about revenue, operating margin, asset efficiency. Customers are much, have a totally different perspective. What's the ease of use of getting and consuming your offerings? A risk reduction and convenience and utility of your products. And environmentally, obviously very different things again, things like carbon footprint and, and resource consumption and so on. So each of these need a completely different map so that we can explain how we, how we compose value. So what does a, a, a value map look like? Well, here's a great one. And this is a publicly available tool that you can go, you can Google for the Deloitte Enterprise Value Map. It's Deloitte's contribution to this topic. They've made it publicly available. And it's a really nice reference model. It's not really something that I would say is too operational that you might apply, but it gives you a great reference to how you might construct one of your own of these. And you can see what they've done here is they've taken shareholder value, they've broken it down into the, these first level revenue growth, operating margin, and so on, which further decompose into things like volume and price reduction. You can get on down. We, we call these up to this level here, the value dials. We can get down something like over here. You probably can't read that, but that says cross sell, upsell. And there's one here about marketing and sales. So these value dials then decompose the value. And from here on down, we have a whole list of things 
that are we call business drivers, things that you can do in generic sense to move the needle on that value down. And Deloitte further break them down into changing what you do, things that change the way you operate, or doing what you do better. So in other words, something doing something new or doing the existing thing you do better. So there's a you can see how you can keep decomposing, and then they've color coded them here by business process area, so you can get a really complex and, and holistic view of your value decomposition. And once you have this map in place, you can then start to map your objectives to a business driver and go up the tree um, and identify exactly the contribution of that particular objectives making. My objectives might actually map to multiple things across you. You could ma uh, map your business outcomes, your initiatives, your even down to the epics and the user stories, the capabilities, the applications, the processes, anything can be mapped into this value map. You can see how whatever element of the operating model you're looking at, how that impacts and contributes to your this dimension of value. And this obviously is a shareholder one, we could have others. Now, what do you do with that? Well, in a tool, you can you can actually get perhaps a little bit more of a, 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 re, a readable perspective on it, and it becomes much more dynamic. This is the exact same tree that I was just showing you. I've come all the way up to, I think it's about level two or three, where you can see the things broken down. Of course, you can go all the way down and have the whole, the whole set of detail in there. But the value in doing that is that we could then jump down and say, let's go and look at the marketing and sales section, lay out the business drivers horizontally, and here's where I've done some of my mapping. I'm showing you some business outcomes mapped into to those, those business drivers. These are the business outcomes of my initiative that we're currently running that we're trying to do, which is focused on marketing and sales, showing exactly their contributions up this, up this tree. And then each of those uh, uh, business outcomes, if I click through the whole prioritization, the business case and everything else, the epics, the user stories, I can get access to those. And as they go through the agile delivery, we're showing their, their progression through the life cycle of stages as they get delivered. Um, totally different view of the world. Um, aligning your, um, once, so once you've got those things in place, how do you then map those, um, uh, your value map into your actual business strategies and so on? Mm -hmm. So I moved on to the align stage of now. So this is a quick look at a strategy on a page, your vision and mission. If you're familiar with the um, business motivation model, um, desired results over here, courses of action over here, and got vision, goals, and objectives, mission, strategies, and initiatives. So coming down this side over here, we can see we've got some business objectives. We moved over to the value map. Here are those value drivers from the from the from value from the from the value tree showing which we're in, you know, cost savings and market share differentiation. Here are the, the business drivers beneath those value drivers, the objectives that we've aligned into those, the key results associated with the objectives and then and the initiatives that are driving towards those things. So starting to get that mapping down and showing the contribution up into value. Each of those objectives, or sorry, each of those initiatives starting to track as they unfold. So really nice way, drill through the on the initiative, get more detail and, and, and track as you go, the contribution to, to um, achievement of these things. Another way you can sort and, and arrange and prioritize your objectives, so that's really the hard thing. Once you've got all your outcomes, your objectives um, defined, how do you decide which of them, which ones uh, are, are um, the, the best, which ones are going to give you the best bang for your buck? How do you put them into a sequence and an order in, in, in a prioritization? So obviously these bubble charts are a, a, a really good tool for doing that. You can have various different dimensions across any of these perspectives here. And in this case, we're looking at impact, disruptive potential and value. Um, the colors and the sizes can represent other things you flag them around and, and, and position them to give you that prioritization of where, to, where, uh, of where you want to invest your money. Okay, moving down into the designing. And this is really adopting a design thinking um, approach. 
So starting with the personas, who is it that we're designing for? What we're trying to come up with here are the, the revised or, or innovated offerings that we're going to deliver to these personas. So each different persona might have different needs, obviously different jobs to be done. Um, jobs to be done is a Osterwalder, uh, well, uh, well actually it's probably, he's adopted that, but it's a well-known approach to thinking about um, the, the needs of your personas and what they're actually trying to do, shaping those and then working backwards from those needs to develop offerings that address um, their specific needs. So a value proposition has the two sides of the, of, of the coin. On one hand, the personas and their, and their needs. The other side is the, the benefits of your, that you will address, you deliver to address those needs and the offerings that uh, um, provide those benefits. There's another really good perspective if you're trying to do um, if you're building value propositions besides the Oscar Gilder's um, value proposition canvas. Um, is this NABC's needs, approach, benefits, and competitive alternatives? Um, so getting a single page for each of your value props and, 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 um, and fully elaborating those. I'll talk about that in a second which is actually represented here. So the NABC value proposition, the need, what gap in the market is this value proposition addressing, the approach, how are you going to do that, the benefits that need to obviously be um, uh, incremental to where they're at today. And then how gives you a great canvas then to elaborate what your differentiation is going to be against the alternatives that they might have, whether they be competitors or whether they be just doing things in, in the way they do them today. So um, another nice little tool. And this is the R version of what the uh, value proposition canvas looks like. This side being the, the, the persona definition, this side being the operate, uh, offering definition. So as you can see, you're just dragging on jobs to be done for a particular persona. In this case, empty nesters, we're doing an insurance claim a value proposition for them. And we're trying to define for empty nesters, what are the, they most concerned about which represent these needs? How can we identify benefits to address those needs? And how then do those benefits align to our offering? And where can we innovate across this offering? And this is what you can use then to look competitively against um, the other alternatives that they have. Beautiful canvas for helping you to identify um, what you need to change. And then the nice thing about this is um, it just manage, it spits out user stories for you that you can then use to start to drive the, the um, backlog of change as you go ahead and, and implement each of these um, things. So as a uh, MTNS that I want, need, so that benefit uh, delivered by an offering item. Okay, customer journey. So, so yeah, uh, with the second dimension to innovation, that was the offering. Here's the, and here, the, or sorry, the value uh, proposition. Here now we're looking at is the value stream. How do we deliver on those value propositions? And, it, and again, it's very tied into that customer journey. So how does the customer receive that value proposition? Through journey maps. You're probably all very familiar with them. They measure and track the, the experience of individual personas as they go through those interactions with you. Um, those uh, journeys are, are aligned to value streams in what we call a service blueprint. The value streams made up of stages. Stages are underpinned by business capabilities, which are then linked down into the people, process, information, and technology. What does that look like? We think of this as perhaps the most useful canvas that you could provide to your business stakeholders to help them understand their parts of the business. In fact, I often, often think that um, one of the huge gaps in our, in our thinking about business, um, um, business analysis and business architecture is that our stakeholders haven't really, none of us have really settled on a mental model for a business operating model. When we think of a business operating model, it's really quite hard to figure out how, how, how do you, what do you, what's the, what do you think of? Typically we think of an org chart. That gives us a very solid perspective to the organization. We think service blueprints are the perfect way of thinking about a business operating model because that what it does is there's a service blueprint pretty much for all of your major interactions with your customers. And they're so personalized 
and, and, and tailored because each, each of these service blueprints can be addressed address a specific persona. So in this case, I'm looking at a journey for, again, insurance claim settlement, and we're looking at it for those same empty nesters represented over here by, by this persona. The, the, the top half of the canvas is a um, journey map, right? This is the customer journey broken down into, into stages. And of course, across those stages, everybody captures different things. You can, you can record anything you want. It could be needs and, uh, and pains and moments of truth and, and satisfaction scores from your, from your uh, surveys at the end of it. Um, the, this gives you feedback then on how this particular persona is responding across the journey. And of course, if I move, change this and pick a different persona, I might get a totally different set of experience. So fantastic tool. I'm sure many of you already have these things. Unfortunately, most of them are static charts in PowerPoint or, or posters even stuck on your walls, which make it really hard because it's just so dynamic and constantly changing. And what we really want to know is not what the picture looks like, for what the heck we can do about the information in here. So for example, these guys here are not very happy in this stage, right? When they're waiting for the results of their claim, they're giving us all, we've got all these indications across these various dimensions that there's an issue here. What do we do about it? Well, this is where the value stream and the operator model alignment comes in. Below the line, this is the on stage. This is the customer on stage as it's being interacted with. Behind the scenes in the backstage, the inside out, this is what we're doing as they're traversing the journey. We're receiving the claim, validating it, and so on and so on, and a bunch of different information here about metrics and so on. But most importantly, this is where we're trying to get to the business capabilities that we have underpinning that stage. So we can start to see, ah, the problem here, it must be with one of these capabilities. And then we can go and identify what are the tech people, what are the processes, what are the technologies and information that's involved here? Uh, are these types of issues they're talking about? Do they look like an information issue? Does it look like a process that but bottleneck? Is it a technology related thing? Let's drill in to Plains family, for example, and see what that technology is and maybe identify where there's the opportunity for change. Overlay pain points onto this thing, overlay maturity onto it, risks onto it. In fact, as you come up with your business outcome, your ideas, throw that on and paste them in. What sort of things could you do to improve claims recovery so that you can move the needle in this stage, right? And that, of course, then feeds into your workshops where you can then progress those things. And eventually they'll become epics or user stories and then we cannot start to see, show me all the change that's currently planned across my, the capabilities for my value stream. My, when I say my value stream, that's exactly what we want. We want business stakeholders to take ownership of this thing so that they get a canvas like this where they're every day being able to log in and analyze dynamically the constantly evolving, changing face of the business operating model through the lens and the canvas of the service blueprint. I have a question here. Do you get to derive the operating model from the service blueprint all added together? How does that work? Exactly, Derek, that's, that's what the goal is. So we have um, the, the whole entire operating model is hanging off of this, um, this scaffold here of the, the stages of the, uh, of the value stream. So, uh, the, so as each, for each value stream stage, the, the building blocks of the operating model being the capabilities decomposed into those tiny little, uh, to, the, to the more granular elements of people, process information technology. This is what gives us the structure for the entire operating model and uh, over which we can um, innovate. Sonia asked, working in the financial sector in Australia, which is highly regulated, how do you define business or customer value for projects that are solely focused on APRA or risk requirements? Right, well, APRA is our banking regulator for Australia, for those who don't know, so this is a governance question. And in fact, that's a perfect use case for this, Sonia. So let's imagine that you have um, APRA regulations um, that, that apply that you need to identify that, and, and, and you need to identify where they fit into your various interactions that could be relating to claims, it could be relating to deposits, it could be relating to applications for mortgages or whatever. So a whole catalog of regulatory needs 
can be mapped into the capabilities that they impact or even down below that the technologies or process steps, but brought out through this lens into being able to identify exactly where you've got, um, where they fit across this canvas. And then if you're finding that you're struggling to meet a particular regulatory need, you can, uh, it, it, this gives you the, the ability to drill into, well, what's going on? What is the issue? What uh, maturity heat mapping on that uh, business capability could be one way to go through. Looking down into the pain points or even just registering, okay, we have a, a, a regulatory issue here and logging that as a pain point and, and defining the change that needs to happen, um, uh, which is, basically puts it all into so much context for the people that are um, needing to address it. Okay, moving on. The last step then is tracking the change. So let's assume we're in train with our, um, our initiative. We've got a really good grasp then on what we're doing to improve our, our, our value our offerings, what we're doing to improve our value streams and our journeys. Um, and now we're trying to figure out, are we actually delivering to what the objectives that we set out do and how do we measure that and track it? Well, firstly, we, if we don't know what we're going, where we're going, we'll never get there. Um, we need to have known and agreed measures that we can set against our objectives through objectives and key results. Key results being the measurable element of the objective. And the great thing about key results is the ownership and accountability that they provide. So we can, we can, delegate, we can define what we want to do, we can measure how, what that move, how we want to move the needle on that, from that objective, and then we can assign that to some person or team and then be able to track progress against those um, key results. Key results could be um, quite, um, uh, they're, they're very time-based, uh, you know, obviously. So you can have these things on a, on, a, on a cyclical basis, quarterly perhaps, half yearly and yearly, and it's just a constant adjustment and, and, and alignment of how you're doing. We'll show you some of those being, being tracked. Um, and then quantitatively, how can we take these individual key results, these measurable metrics, and roll them up through a value tree to be able to align that into a hierarchical ROI and in the business case. And, and uh, so value trees are an awesome mechanism for doing that. You can see the whole decomposition of where this value is coming from quantitatively up from the various business outcomes and, and their associated um, key results into the overall delivery of, of the value assessment um, for the initiative. Here, in fact, is exactly that. A dashboard showing us the, 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 um, the alignment of objectives to key results for a given key result, the full summary, the value alignment, the strategic alignment, and then as you track and, and measure against your, um, your plan and the alignment of your various tactics and initiatives um, against, um, against the achievement of that key result. Um, drilling through, obviously, to be able to, to measure it. So each of these are uh, with a target date and then assigned to a particular group, in this case, risk management. And here they're easily able to see what the number is that they're trying to achieve and exactly where they are in the progression in, in, of, of getting to it towards their target. The whole, the whole entire um, initiative, the whole company can be um, assigned to, uh, key results in this way and and uh, and monitored and managed by um, to be able to keep yourself, keep you, make sure you're on track. Um, the great sort of perspective on, on any of your initiatives before you even get going, and this is something we feel doesn't really happen very much, is this idea of a value assessment. If you could do this right up front, in other words, try to envisage your future and then work backwards from it. We use this thing called a, a value assessment where we have a business case, we set that up right from the start, defining what it is that we're trying to achieve, who are the stakeholders, what benefits are we going to be able to do, categorizing them, um, uh, risks and, 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 uh, and evaluating the, the degree of those risks, and then aligning into your, into your uh, value assessment all of your targeted key results. So what are your hopes that you're going to actually be able to address 
Um, and then as you as time moves on, this is dynamically updated with your actuals. You can see track your percentages. So this is down at the detailed level, the, the, the things that are feeding into those charts and graphs that I showed you on the dashboard on the, on the previous page. And then finally, the value tree, so this is what the value tree looks like. So if your whole entire initiative is made up of two, you know, broken down into its dimensions, revenue improvement and cost reduction in this case, and the various contributions from your various objectives or outcomes that you're looking for, and then the calculations over time of what you're expecting, so you can see uh, um, what the overall contribution is as it rolls up. A brilliant way of demonstrating the um, the ROI and the and the value asset contribution of all of your different needs to help you to prioritize the, the sorry the of your scope to help you to prioritize the scope as you're trying to raise in, in uh, your business case for approval. Okay, bang on. 43 minutes, I think. Um, I'm going to pause there. Before I, before I open it up for questions, I promised that we would um, give you the detail on this. So, so we have a white paper that we have written on the whole topic. It take, takes you through much more detail than I um, did there the, in, in my brief summary. I will copy this link into the chat for you. And you're welcome to go there and grab that. We'll also be sending it out. The IIBA will be sending it out um, in a follow-up email. But right, ready to um, take any questions. Fantastic. Oh, Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I see you've got already some questions in there. Do you want to just go ahead and uh, go through them yourself? Sure, I've done the first two. Let me grab Ellen's one here. Um, how would you approach this from a local government perspective as we have a large number of service offerings? Oh, brilliant. Ellen, I think um, for the public sector, this is probably one of the best use cases that you could imagine. In fact, because every single thing that the public, that the government does for citizens is a is a service offering that follows a very, very similar stages of uh, understanding what the customer needs, evaluating their right to get it, deciding whether, whether they're eligible, um, to, uh, transacting over it, and then fulfilling. And, you can, and we did, we've done this for a number of uh, government agencies in Australia, if anybody's familiar with Service New South Wales, that's our first an uh, uh, application of this approach. And we created this um, value stream for them, which they could then just overlay every single one of their various interactions and their service offerings with their cus customers and across these common um, stages. Not only that, they could identify reusability of where they could find common capabilities that applied across all of the service offerings and then identify those service offerings that had uniqueness where that might be. Generally, it's in the, term, in the form of the, the type of information and the type of fulfillment that you need to do for the different offerings. But the canvas applies universally. And if you did this, you get this service catalog, all your services with its own service blueprint of exactly how you, you're, you're delivering on those services. So absolutely perfect use case. Are there any license restrictions to use the Deloitte shareholder value map? Um, I don't believe so, uh, uh, Dennis. It's, as I said, publicly available. Just go and do a, a Google search. That's where I found it. Um, there is, a, if you can find it, actually quite a detailed white paper that Deloitte has associated with it. A bit harder to find that, but I have to come across it. But actually, this idea of enterprise value maps, um, there are others. And uh, if you go and, go and, and do some research, you'll find find um, various other authors who've got uh, quite complex and comprehensive views on value maps. Now, what I would say though, is I would only use them as a guide, right? It, if you think of wanting to overwhelm your audience, I don't think many of us would want to put something like that in front of the business state, tell me where your value sits in here, right? A lot of this will probably not be relevant to you, but that's the great, point of a, of a reference model. You pick and choose what's meaningful, what's you, it's to give you guidance and ideas 
to, to adapt this to your own needs. And so creating your own will be your secret to success. And I would say start simple. If this is comprehensive. This is like your end goal. You won't want to get there on day one with something as massive as this. Just very small uh, uh, dimensions are quite fine. Um, and you may only start by mapping into levels one or two up here. You know, that, that's a really good uh, perspective. And think and don't uh, restrict it to one dimension. This is, this is only one view, shareholders. Generally, when we're doing transformation, we're innovating and transforming for customers. So getting a customer value map is a really important one. But what about your internal stakeholders? Like what are the things that are important to employees? You know, things like culture and, and, and um, compensation and other aspects uh, that, that would demonstrate um, value to them and so on. So yeah, I suggest you know, having multiple of these, keeping them quite simple to begin with, but then all the objectives actually can, can it, it, gives, it shows you coverage by the time you've got a couple of these on a couple of different dimensions. Um, this approach, are there licenses in here? Um, through we're about to start a customer journey mapping project so very tiny you're welcome Ellen awesome I uh, wish you luck and I um, and I think that that's an awesome place to start um, get your personas identified and and figure out what your um, interactions are for your for your journeys and uh, and and then really don't restrict it to the customer's perspective as you're defining those customer stages think about your your um, um, backstage stages that align into those and keep on going down into the uh, uh, capabilities. Neil Burston, how do you cope with the sheer size of the maps? They look great, but daunting. Exactly. Well, that was my point, right? I don't think it's wise to use something like this in an operational sense. As I said, it's a reference model. So you might find there are, I don't know, maybe 200 Business drivers here, you, you might want to just whittle it down to the 20 or so that are that are relevant to you. And as I said, I would I would perhaps not go all the way down. Of course, you can decompose later, right? And that's a great thing with any taxonomy or hierarchy. You can always take anything here and break it further apart. But to begin with, don't concern yourself about going too far down. That would be my recommendation. Hey, Terry, I think I see a few questions in the Q&A. Did you get to Leigh and Derek's questions? I can okay. I can read them back to you. Got them here, thank you. In implementing this, which part of the value engineering is the most difficult? Well, I, what we're trying to do is help you, give you the methodology. And I actually think if you follow the, the, the approach, it really is quite, self-explanatory, but where you, have, where, where you run into challenges, I wouldn't say it's necessarily with any one of the stages, the challenge is always in getting the buy-in, in getting people to, to see the value in, in an approach like this and understanding and committing to what, what yeah, the idea of, for example, the whole capability-based planning approach and the, and the idea of, 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 um, of service blueprints and, and, and value streams and, and, and journeys. Yeah, this is a, it's, it's, it's a nice tool, but if your business stakeholders aren't um, really using it and aren't bought in, it can just be um, you know, paper, uh, lip service. So, um, so that's really what I would say is the hardest thing always is getting the, the executive buy -in. I think you've got to try and do something small, demonstrate, demonstrate and, and try to put together the, the case for it. Uh, uh, you know, work with work with uh, consult. I mean, we we help people in in trying to elaborate um, the the, um, the the business case for something like this. So, if you'd like to speak to us, we could try and point you in the right direction. Um, but but I think if it's not so much a, a particular stage or a particular activity in that that's, that can bog you down or be difficult, it's really just getting people aligned around it. We have a bit more detail on the difference between business capabilities and business processes. <laughs> um, age old question that, and um, I think that 
capabilities, it might be the capability perspective on the operating model is an evolution um, that brings a more holistic view than the process centric view that, we, that, that we've been on for the past 30, 40 years. I think processes have been, were, were an awesome starting point for people to start to think about how parts of the business operation work. They're very um, flow centric. A uh, whole BPM in uh, uh, and notation, there isn't a structured element for data, for example. So it's all about flow logic. What do you do next? Um, there's nothing there about what, how does data get, how, how does things get created and, and, and changed and, and consumed across the journey. So what, what capabilities do is they, they contextualize the process into a broader perspective. So it brings in the perspective of information and it brings in the technologies that, that align to that process. So processes, you know, you, you have no idea which technologies, where are you using and where does, where do those uh, technical technologies points happen this is what capabilities help you with and then, and, and then the very important perspective of skills and people and roles and teams across the whole the whole flow so i think they've got a place i think of capabilities as being the what and and processes is really being very focused on the how um, but they both bring a, a, a very good dimension and and probably the conjunction between the two um, really um, provide the full context. Healthcare and pharma is a huge interoperability issues and due to skepticism and leadership about digital transformation, it is slow evolving. What would be your suggestion to gather momentum and shorten the time involved to launch? Yeah, I think um, fatigue with this topic of Transformation is rife. I think we're all a little bit jaded about it. Um, I think people have been riding the the um, um, the wave of this buzzword for a while. And the fact that you know so much of it has not yielded anything, it's, it can often be seen as like a technology vendor's uh, the latest um, you know um, status pitch, really. Um, so you know in, in, in in part, we've now created a challenge for ourselves in that we've got to prove that there's actual value in it. I think that it comes down to the idea that change is inevitable. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is probably one that's had the, the, the biggest global um, shock to its system over the past couple of years with the pandemic. And, and this sort of thing indicates, you know, the, the um, how quickly things can change, the world can shift. Um, you know, there's a well-known quote from, um, uh, uh, well, I think it was Pierre Natun, who, who was the CEO of Extension in 2015. He pointed out that at that time, which is already seven years ago, um, but at that time, um, nearly, nearly half of the um, S&P 500 from the year 2000, right? So the S&P 500 list, 15 years earlier, by 2015, half of them didn't exist or, or were no longer on that list, disrupted, hit between the eyes by digital for the most part. And so the idea that we can com be complacent, sit still and not, not be constantly innovating and focusing on, on um, you know, moving and, and, and adjusting and adapting, that'll, that, that, that's something of the past. And, and the faster that we're able to, the, the better our culture is able to adapt, the, the, um, um, the better we, we, you know, we're gonna be able to survive in a constantly changing world. Now, how do you go and, and, and get your leadership brought into that? And what do we suggest to, to shorten your time to launch? I think that's a very hard thing to do, but, Having a clear method and a clear approach and a structured, recognized um, uh, uh, tools and methods and 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 and, and uh, um, showing them simply that you you've got a journey and a plan that's probably the first step. So hopefully, what we've provided you today can give you a little bit of um, help down that path. Where should we go to learn more about business capabilities? Are there standard references? 
Yes, so there are business capabilities are the foundation um, components of business architecture. So any business architect, the first thing that they do typically is create a business capability map. Um, business capability maps can be very industry specific, obviously, So and you can find great um, reference models for different industries. Um, one of the best sources for uh, capabilities uh, for the, the information about the concept of capabilities and also for reference models for different industries is the Business Architecture Guild. Um, so just the same way that the IIBA has the BABOC, the Business Architecture Guild has the BISBOC, and that is a very comprehensive document similar to BABOC that explains you know, all the concepts of business architecture, um, detailed about the things I've talked about today, uh, value streams and capability maps in particular, and, um, and they have um, reference models for half a dozen or more industries. But there are others, depending on your industry, um, you know, I know that there's insurance bodies that like Accord who has uh, uh, capability maps, um, banking industry, and it, there's plenty of them around, and, and I'm sure many of the other industries as well. I'm just going to do a time check right now, Terry. We're coming up near the end, so I think Sonia will have to be our last question for the day. Okay. How do you see the data function in an organization fitting into value streams? Perfect. Well, data is one of the four elements that we talked about for that, that comprise a capability. People, process, information, and technology. So if you think of each of these capabilities, you can see I could come down here and pick my record, my data objects, and this explode out and show me which data objects are the core objects that underpin each of these capabilities, right? And so immediately across the whole journey, you get to see a little map of all your information objects, where they're important, where they're relevant. Oftentimes, it's the same one just sort of progressing through cycle of stages across the journey. Um, and, and then you can do things like heat map those objects with their um, maturity or, 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 or um, data, data, any sort of data issues that you might have or, or be able to identify. You can overlay pain points that you might have with data, ideas you might have for cleaning up the data. So it's a very nice map. You know, obviously the data, data architects, they have their detailed data models and so on. The hard thing is for them is to know where the heck is this data used in, in the real world and how, how do business stakeholders actually consume it? And a similar in the other direction, business stakeholders go, well, I know there's a lot of stuff there in data, but I don't even know how it comes up. If I could just get a nice view of where data fits and what data I use and consume across here, that would be brilliant. So good question, Sonia, thank you. I think that's probably it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're coming up on the end of the hour then, Terry. Now, uh, just one message came through from the audience, just with the white paper not being quite the same thing as the slide deck, if people sign up for the white paper, do you think they might be able to get access to the slides or is, yes. is that a, perfect? Okay. So just so the audience knows, if uh, you sign up for the white paper, then Capsify can, um, can uh, get you in touch with these slides as well. So I'll, I'll just start closing off the webinar then. So thank you again, Terry, for a, a fantastic presentation. I, I can't express how much it means to our audience that you're just seeing the messages flooding through right now. So that wraps up our time for Q&A for the webinar today. So thank you to our attendees for asking some great questions and being here with us. And thank you very much, Terry, for joining us today. Do you have any parting words? I just want to say thank you, Marat, both to you, the IIBA, and of course to the whole audience. And as you said, great questions. It's been awesome. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out, find me on LinkedIn or through the website, I'd be more than happy to carry on the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye.